I mean, you can literally go from being, dare I say, a nobody at work to chipping away and building something on your own and either being a rock star for somebody else or being a rock star for yourself. Yeah. And it starts with you sort of putting those ideas out there and going through that rhythm over and over again for like a couple of years right. before it feels natural. It doesn't feel icky and you find that rhythm. And once you do that, it just starts to naturally be a part of your life. And that is, I think, where you start to see the answers to some of those questions. What are you known for? Yeah. Right. That's when opportunities start showing up to your front door because I was in this meeting. Somebody said this thing and you were the first person that popped in my head. That's what people want. Yes. Right? You want it as an entrepreneur. You want that as a prospective uh, employee. Like you want to be thought of when you're not in the room. I'm Kirsten. And I'm Julian. And today we're talking about self-promotion and why it's so important to put yourself out there. Yes. But first, I want to give a shout out to Ray Newell. That's pretty clever. <laughs> Ray Newell. It is. Uh, left a five-star review for us that said, my top financial podcast, hey. they have attainable goals without giving guilt. Always based on facts and research, relatable, and they are giving great representation. It's giving great representation. It's giving I like representation. That. I like that. Thank you, Ray Newell. Um, also, keep the reviews coming. We are getting pretty close, if I'm not mistaken, to, to 400. 400. I know. I hope we get there. I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe we'll celebrate with some air horns or something. But I am ready to do that. And in the spirit of bragging and self-promotion, let's talk about this. This has been a topic that is not one that we've ever really zeroed in on exclusively. We've spoken about it with respect to LinkedIn. We've spoken about it with respect to your career and your identity. And now we're just zeroing in on that and, and for very, very big reasons. But like, I think now more than ever, it's never been more important to figure out how to self promote aggressively or comfortably so that you can get what you deserve. That's it. Because right now, when you think about how tight and how competitive the labor market is, even if you have best degree from the best school, huge fraternity and sorority and network behind you, like the industry is what it is, right? There's a lot of competition out there. You and everybody else know somebody and everyone is fighting for these jobs. And I think it's even more challenging now because you've got AI mm -hmm. and like, even if people don't know exactly how they want AI to play into that role, if you have nothing to say with respect to AI, you're likely going to end up being in a disadvantaged position versus somebody else who's trying to come for that job. And so all of that to say what we found and what we know to be true is that the people who brag better and not, I'm not saying be obnoxious, right? But we're talking about bragging, self-promotion, building a personal brand. Those are the people who consistently have stood out, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're traditionally employed. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think we've always known that we have to be better than most people, but yep. we doubled down on being twice as good, right? Yeah. We knew we had to be more than just good. So we were like, all right, well, I'll be twice as good. But we didn't focus on being twice as findable. Yeah. And in a digital world, when things are happening online, when jobs and positions are being contracted online using those tools, you have to be findable. You yeah. have people have to be able to see that you are available and what you have to offer. And it's really not even about you. It's about your ideas, your talent, your experiences, your message and your ideas. I already said ideas, but you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, in essence, it, it has made us more entrepreneurial. Like you said, like entrepreneurs know firsthand what it's like to eat what you kill and to have to go after it and get it. But it's now expanded to yeah. people who typically would have like really stable careers. Like yeah. there are a lot of people who opted out of this because they're like, well, I'm an accountant. And yeah, I, I think I'm so glad you said that because I'm having flashbacks. We haven't had these kinds of conversations in a while. It reminds me of when I first started out in my career and there were all these conversations about being entrepreneurial, where you can kind of right size all of that creativity and all of these new ideas and basically give it to the company or use it as a lever to help get promoted. And I remember even then 
there was like a class of people who were like, well, sure, if that's what you new age people need to do to get ahead, that's fine. But we did it through good old fashioned, coming in early, staying late, hard work and getting there. And I remember back then thinking that, wow, okay, that's interesting, but I'm up for the task because like I'm equipped to continue to do this. And that's exactly what I did. And it worked to my advantage. Well, what, 15 years later now, I've now since left that workforce, I'm in a completely different environment here, still competitive, but I'm having these conversations more and more often with people my age, who it's very clear that when they got that same advice, when we were at that same point in our careers, they decided that they weren't going to do it. But you got to remember, there was a time where social media was considered a fad <laughs> and people who self-promoted were considered narcissistic and self-absorbed and they weren't company people, right? And so in some ways, I kind of understand why so many people may have left that skill set alone and said, you know what, that's for those people who are extreme extroverts or crave attention all the time. That's not me. I don't have to do that. But the reality is now they're at a point in their careers, late thirties, early forties, maybe even older. And they're realizing that, Hey man, like I don't have a shiny thing. I don't have a thing that drums up business or drums up leads or prospects. And again, that's relevant, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're right. traditionally employed. Yeah. And I think it's important that we mention that this is a conversation that we're having in May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month. Yeah. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because that feeling, that pressure is a source of anguish for so many of my mid-level career friends or people who made different decisions a couple of years ago. Like it creates this anxiety because the reality is it's a double-edged sword, especially yeah. if we're talking about self-promotion online. There are multiple ways to self-promote. You can do it in person. You can do it just by asking people to leave reviews. Like there's a number of ways to do it, but for today's conversation, we'll just focus online. Yeah. And like, it is this double-edged sword. Like on the one hand, there's a lot of agency that comes when you have a strong personal brand. You feel like you have a greater sense of control over your career. It opens up doors to additional income sources. And that's important for people who, for whatever reason, face barriers to traditional employment. It could be that they are, they have a disability or that they need childcare or that they're required to be at home for any reason. And they can't get traditional employment at the same rate that they can by drumming up their own business. Yeah. And so that's empowering, right? It's empowering to find out that you can build this audience that opens doors for you, especially if you're in a creative career, like a musician or an artist or a photographer, a videographer, yeah. the ability to build an audience allows you to bypass a lot of gates that have been kept. You can kind of skip the line because now you have a market on yes. your own. On the other hand, the pressure to constantly post to always be online and to reveal more and more personal aspects of your life because yeah. the audience demands it or you think the algorithm requires it, that yeah. leads to anxiety and depression and burnout. So it's like people are scared to dabble because they see both extremes. Yeah, I think, I think the lines without question get a little blurry sometimes, right? Because especially when you're talking about social media and self-promotion, there's you and then there's like who you are on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, or we maybe don't get into that. There's who you are on <laughs> Instagram. Even to some extent, we deal with that sometimes where, you know, we meet someone who knows who we are, is familiar with our work, but they are always shocked, right? And like it's it's like one of the weirdest compliments. Like, oh my gosh, you guys are the so same. regular. Yeah. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of that was the whole point. You know what I mean? But I, I get it. Um, because to your point. Whenever we see someone who, or a group of people who've done something great, and we, we experience it even as authors, as I'm specifically thinking about it, there are people who have sold hundreds of thousands of books. We have not sold hundreds of thousands of books to my knowledge, <laughs> unless something changed <laughs> no. yesterday, but we're happy with what we've sold, with what we've produced, with the people that we're reaching. But there's always like that, 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 that thing that's like, man, like, I, I guess I have to do the things that those people did. And we've always been very clear about that. Like, I don't want to be that person, right? Not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but I know who I am. Like we've done the work. We are clear on what we want out of life, what we want out of this business opportunity, what we want out of several things. And as a result, we've created these boundaries. And I think that's part of what a lot of these people need to do is to say, hey, even when you are competing at the highest of levels, you're looking for a job, you still have to be clear on what those boundaries are, because they can be really, really harmful if you find yourself 
doing things that just burn you out or lead to a different type of frustration. It's like you're frustrated with your job. You want to get ahead or you want to leave there and go into something else. And there are things about that job that frustrates you, but then you take those things and you kind of apply it to yourself. Mm -hmm. You add your own pressure, your own unrealistic expectations on yourself because you think that this is what you need to do to get ahead. And so it can be tricky. And to your point, I understand why people may be hesitant or may have left that thing alone. But unfortunately, we're also seeing that that lack of self-promotion, that lack of having built an audience or a personal brand oftentimes leads to you being left behind and not being given opportunities that some of the other people that you're competing with are getting. Yes. I love that you brought up our book because I don't know if this is true or not. I haven't read every personal finance book, but I've read a lot of them, like yeah. dozens and dozens of them. And I'm convinced that our book is one of the only books, if not the only book that has a whole chapter dedicated to selling yes. because that's how important this is, right? Yeah. It's not fair. I wish it were different, but it is a natural conclusion. If you have a version of capitalism that requires you to sell your labor yeah. in exchange for money, just to have the basic necessities, there's nothing kind of built into just being a citizen. You got to sell something to you get sell something some back. Shit. I'm right? sure that's what we said in the book. <laughs> you do. You nothing happens until shit. you sell some shit. Yeah. And you have this consumer economy, like the heartbeat of our economy is based on your ability to purchase things. And so it is the lifeblood of the country that we live in. And so it's it's a life skill to be able to do it. I think what we're trying to say is there are no easy answers. Like you're not going to walk away from this podcast. I mean, you might walk away from this podcast feeling like revved up and ready to go, but there are ways to make it more easy to accept. And I think the first one is just starting with a strategy. Having a strategy around your self-promotion can make it feel so much less soul-crushing, so much less salesy. It kind of takes the bite out of feeling like a sellout simply because you have a strategic purpose for why you're doing things. And a lot of people, unfortunately, will start with tactics. They'll find someone online who says, you know, you got to post three times yeah. a day. You got to do the memes and the B-roll and you got to point and you got to dance and you got to find the trending topic and find... You start with the tactics instead of a sustainable approach to self-promotion because a one-off post isn't going to do anything. Like if you just every so often post novelly, unless it's something like a baby, an engagement, you know, a, a death or, you know, something novel, it's not going to do much. It's not going to drum up any engagement. But if you have something that is sustainable, something that you can do for a long period of time without getting caught in this constant cycle of placating to an algorithm, you actually have the ability to build a fan. But strategy can also be overwhelming. It, it you can know, I think be. some people hear that word and it's like, yeah, but I don't know how to do that. And, yes. you know, it's like they immediately think I need to hire a coach or someone who's yes. going to build it or develop it for me. I need and, a full content plan. I need this, that, and the other. And it's like, you really don't. Like when I think about strategy, it's really just a matter of saying like, what is it that you are trying to accomplish? And it's like, to your point, you said to be findable, right? You really just have to think about a strategy from a standpoint of saying, what problem is it that I'm trying to solve right now? If someone were looking for me as amazing as I am, how would they find me? Right. And then you compare that to all of the other places where they might be looking. If you're not in those places, then like, that's the strategy. The strategy is to make yourself findable within the places where the people that you're trying to attract can find you, right? So that doesn't mean you have to post three times a day or all of a sudden be comfortable on camera, right? We weren't always comfortable on camera. And I would say to some extent, we're still not comfortable on camera, or at least we have some uncomfortable moments. But the point is, you don't have to hear that word because I know someone is out there who's like, oh my gosh, like I don't even know where to start. Like I, I can't undertake a strategy. And it's like, no, nah, it's like just focus on being findable, like just start there. And like, that's half the battle. Find a sustainable way yes. to be findable, yes. right? Because the strategy has to be sustainable. The problem when people fall into the funnel of tactics, whether it's posting a hundred times a day or chasing trending sounds and topics, the problem is you spend a lot of time doing that Yes, and you will mess around and go viral and get the thing that you thought you wanted. But now you spend all of your time as a content creator chasing these viral trends and algorithmic yeah. shifts instead of actually getting better 
better at the thing that you're supposed to be marketing. I want to just focus our attention back on the people who are looking for those jobs, because that also happens, not just for creators. It happens for people who are out there looking for a job. I think the answer is somewhere in the middle, right? Yes. It's like finding this nice, comfortable, sustainable approach to self-promotion that makes sure that the people who are looking in certain places are going to include you in the short list of people based on the routine and the content and the ideas that you've been sharing on your social media profile. And I think the other thing is that you hear people talk about the algorithm a lot, right? It's, it's like, it's almost like demand, you know, like back in the day, it was like the man is trying to hold me down. The algorithm, <laughs> there's, there's so, like, first of all, there's several of them, right? There's no one algorithm. Yeah, there is not just one there's algorithm. There's no master. That's shorthand for multiple algorithms. <laughs> I think, you know, you don't want to get discouraged by that, right? Because I get it. Like, I remember those days when you put yourself out there and you just think it's the best thing ever. And oh my gosh, like, and maybe even you're specifically looking for someone in particular to react and you just get nothing, right? It's like soul crushing. It's like devastating. You feel like this is why I didn't do it to begin with. This is why I don't want to do this kind Algorithm of stuff. Algorithm very in my it's, content. It's biased to <laughs> these kinds of people are never going to win. And it is. It, it is. But that doesn't mean you stop. Like That's this right. is necessary. Like it's it's like saying, you know, I got a cavity and I did everything right. I brushed my teeth and I floss and I'm just going to stop brushing my teeth and floss. You know what I mean? I've literally yeah. been there because I felt like I did everything right, but it didn't matter. You still ended up with a cavity or with deep, what do they call it? You still need a deep cleaning or something like that. I, don't, I didn't it, know where you was going. It's painful. Because you do brush your teeth. I do. I brush my teeth like <laughs> quite often, but it's devastating when my <laughs> dentist tells me that, hey, man, you got to do a better job. It's like, what? Like, what more can I possibly do? Right. So, but I get it. All that to say, like, when we're talking about jobs, when we're talking about opportunities for advancement, we are just not at an age anymore where I think people can kind of take this lightly. Like, it has to be something that you focus on continually. And if anything, it's only going to get more challenging. And my concern is for the people who haven't even really started yet. Yeah. I want to talk to the people who aren't doing this because it's not who they are, right? Like oh, yeah. I, that, I'm, I'm going to take my own advice and be very specific about who I'm talking to right now. You know, now. I knew we were going to go, go there and I'm going to go ahead and give you license. Not that you need it to go <laughs> ahead and we can always bleep out a name, but because it just gets <laughs> awkward. When you say, well, I know a person, just say the name and then we bleep it out. Listen, I, I know a person. I know several people I who know who you're talking about. <laughs> I know several people who are just like, that's just not me. Like yeah. I was raised not to brag and blah, 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 blah. I just see people who take their identity to the extreme and use it as an excuse not to do the thing that they know they need to do, which is to talk more about their work online or yeah. to more people. And I think I want to make it clear that when we say, like, don't sign up for tactics that, you know, aren't you or that don't feel aligned, we're not talking about you as like a whole person. We're talking about you in the context of what you want, what you're trying to achieve. And so I actually read this book called Brag Better. It's by Meredith Feynman, and she is our, uh, she's our label mate. <laughs> she, she's our label mate on portfolio. In, in print. In print mate, Cousin. whatever you call it. There's a chapter on being strategic, and she offers five Five questions to ask yourself. I don't even think it's five. I think it's like three or four, but I wanted to share them because I thought these are good and I still go back to them anytime I'm having an existential crisis about promoting myself online. So the first one is, what do you want? And that can be a very scary question. I noticed that people hedge when they're trying to answer, what do you want? Because it, it might make you feel bad. Like you might want a half a million dollars a year, or you might want a full-time remote job, but you think you should settle for what's possible to get. Yeah. And the key is to be very honest about what you want. And if it feels too big, chunk it up into timelines. So what do you want this week? What do you want this month? What do you want this year? And yeah. that can help you think a little smaller. The second question to ask yourself is how do you think you're going to get it? That's another question that gets you to think about steps and it'll highlight where you're actually betting on luck, where yeah. you're hoping to get lucky. Because if you don't have a step on how you're going to get to a half a million dollars a year, you don't know what those positions are called, what credentials they require. It's going to be very difficult to actually get what you want. 
The third question you should ask yourself is what do you want to be known for? And if you can't answer that, then just focus on what you should be known for in mm. order to get the things that you want. So this is what people call your subject matter, or this is your lane. This is where, you know, your content is focused. And when you're answering this question, what do you want to be known for? Try to avoid all that jargony stuff. Like I want to be a visionary team player. Like <laughs> don't put that because that means different things to different people. You should actually be very specific about what you want to be known for, what ideas, what ways of working, what personality traits do you want to be known for? And then the last question is, who am I talking to? Because you have to consider your audience. If you want to make whatever you're saying appealing to them, it's very different to get attention from your friends and your family versus the attention that is focused towards advancing your professional goals. Yeah. Yeah, I like this. And I'm really glad that you brought this up. I wasn't sure if you were going to bring up that book uh, because I know originally we were wondering whether or not we would make this an interview, but I'm glad that you brought it up. This is like a nice, happy meeting. And maybe we might actually bring Meredith onto the podcast at some point. You guys let us know in the comments or send us a note if you think you want to hear more about her book and the way that she thinks. One of the things that I really, really liked about that is like, what do you want to be known for? Because for me, like that's certainly something that I've thought quite a lot about. And certainly as we were building out Rich and Regular, like I remember thinking and being very clear about how we wanted to stand out in what at the time seemed like a crowded, this is crazy to think that it felt like a crowded space then, even though now it was probably like five times bigger, but the strategy is still very much the same. Like we focus on being different and offering a different point of view and using different ways of trying to make this kind of content interesting. But I also want to go back to the mental health aspect, because like there's a lot of concern about mental health and social media and bragging, and obviously a lot of concern about being considered uh, self-centered or uh, narcissistic. What we don't hear enough about is like how it does actually can be beneficial, right? Like it can be that kind of confidence boost that you need in those moments. I remember, for example, when I was traditionally employed, there used to be, I feel like I've told this story before, but I'll say it again. There used to be this award that was like given to like whoever like was the rock star yeah. on the team. And I remember thinking like, that was a goal. I'm pretty sure like I put it on my, on my, my plan, my PDP for the year that I was going to win that award. And I was like, I felt really well positioned because I had budget and I had alignment and I was uniquely qualified for it. And I just got nothing, like nothing, no credit. I like, I'm pretty sure I wasn't even nominated, like nothing. At the same time, we started building things out for Rich and Regular. We started to get press. We started to get mainstream attention. We were in a documentary. We started having opportunities presented to us. And that leads to everything that we've been doing over the last couple of years. And I just remember thinking, like, how beat down I would feel if that group of people were, like, the only source of confidence boost that I had outside of myself. Like, I, I certainly had a strong sense of, self-confidence, but like every now and then you kind of need that validation. And if that were the only group of people and I didn't get the job and I continually didn't win the award and I didn't get that recognition, I would feel very small. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people are going through right now. And I think that's why they struggle with it. They just, they just think that they're not a rock star. And I'm just telling you, like I, I was, I mean, I was good at my job, but I was never considered the rock star. I was considered a rock star as an entrepreneur, <laughs> for sure. And that's yeah. work that I had to do. But even then, there's tons of things that I still, that we still have never won, have never yeah. uh, been afforded. But we've, like, I've won more awards as an entrepreneur that I can count, mm -hmm. literally. More recognition, more press than I could have ever even wrapped my head around when I was traditionally employed. And that's part of the reason why. We have so much confidence in yes. what we're doing and what we're building right now. And so this is kind of what I'm hoping other people can do. Like you, I'm, you can literally go from being, dare I say, a nobody at work to chipping away and building something on your own and either being a rock star some, for somebody else or being a rock star for yourself. Yeah. And it starts with you sort of putting those ideas out there and going through that rhythm over and over again for like a couple of years right. before it feels natural. It doesn't feel icky and you find that rhythm. And once you do that, it just starts to naturally be a part of your life. And that is, I think, where you start to see the answers to some of those questions. What are you known for? Yeah. Right. That's when opportunities start showing up to your front door, because I was in this meeting. Somebody said this thing and you were the first person that popped in my head. That's what people want. 
Yes. Right? You want it as an entrepreneur. You want that as a prospective uh, employee. Like you want to be thought of when you're not in the room. And that is what this is all about. And when you think about the financial milestones that people are depending on to hit their goals, whether it's a promotion or a pay raise or an opportunity, when you think about the number of them that take place in rooms where you're not in, yes. right, you have to give people something to talk about. You have to give people their lines. You're not going to be there to sway the conversation when it comes down to the final decision. If you are a top three candidate, if you want to be the one that they pick, then you have to make sure that everybody who's a part of that decision can do their due diligence, whether you were in the room or not. And leaving a trail, a paper trail online or some sort of digital trail is one way to make sure that people know what you want them to say when they're talking about you. If somebody does find the confidence based on the work that you've been doing to make a recommendation for you, whether it be for a job, for a business opportunity, a partnership, whatever, and then they're trying to convince somebody else and that person hasn't heard of you and they say, what's their name? And they Google you and they don't like what they see or they don't see anything, the credibility of that other person is gone. And in fact, I would argue that that person likely wouldn't even mention it because they already know that there's nothing online to validate whatever it yeah. is that they're saying about you, right? Yeah. And so this is why these kinds of things are so important. And again, like this is not just for the people who wanna take things to like the upper, upper next level. Like this is the new bar. If you have not figured out what your personal brand is, what you're known for, and you have a both in-person and digital footprint to validate that, those claims, you are likely going to either be laid off and struggle to find a job, or you're going to be trying to find another job and just wondering why is it you, taking, so it's long? taking so long, or you can't seem to convince anyone that you are who you say you are. Yeah. I think one of the tactics to ensure that you're set up well to be that person who is mentioned in rooms that you're not in is to make sure that the content and the work that you're putting out there, even if we're not talking about online, make sure what you're saying about yourself is memorable. Yeah. And the way to be memorable is to be specific. I see a lot of chat GPT, AI driven junk out there right now, because again, people are relying on tactics instead of leaning into strategy. Yeah. And the way that I can tell that it was written by AI is because it's not specific. AI does not have the ability to be specific in a human way, right? It can give you a list of things. You can certainly prompt it to be more specific, yeah. but it's not going to do it the same way that someone who has actually done the thing knows how to be specific. So for example, one way to be specific is to talk about what you don't do. There's the conventional wisdom and then there's like what you don't do. I don't budget because I automate my savings first. When I've already paid myself first, when I've already taken care of saving and investing, I can just spend rest freely because that's what's left over, right? So that's just one way to be specific by sharing what you don't do. If you are a project manager and you're trying to create some sort of memorable post, then talk about what you didn't do in meetings. Talk about the calendar invites that you didn't attend for whatever reason. And it just helps people understand your thinking a little differently and know that you bring something to the table. At the very least, it'll encourage people to ask more clarifying questions and that engagement in and of itself is a mental health booth because again, you have people asking you about something that is relative and that you believe in to what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I alluded to this earlier in this conversation, but like, it doesn't happen instantly. Like, sure. There are some people who the first time or the first month in which they post, like something goes viral and going viral is not like required here. You know, no. like I'm just talking about making sure that you are present in the places where the people who can positively affect your earning potential are validated in their query and hopefully their decision to give you the money that you think that you deserve. And it's really about making sure that when they find you, that you're ready to go, that you're a no brainer, right? That when they get there, it was like, ah, this is what I heard about this person, or this is how they describe themselves. And I can validate it based on what I've seen. Mm -hmm. They are a real person. They are really passionate about the subject. And that's exactly who we're looking for, right? That's what this is about. And what happens more often than not is that they have those suspicions, they have those feelings, but they can't really validate it. 
And so they naturally are either like, yeah, a little skeptical or they go with the person where they can say, oh, well, this person actually feels like a much better fit because I can see before I even bring them in here, before we even move them further along through this process, that they are the type of person that we're looking for. And that's why finding a way to brag better, to use Meredith's language here, is so important, but also why it's so incredibly important to stay focused, even during the downtimes, because yes. if you can start for the first month, the first week, whatever it is, you don't get any engagement. And then people just give up. They say, you know what? This isn't working. And I'm not saying you should never give up, but like, if it's a really relevant place, like LinkedIn, like that's a place you want to be. If you are planning on finding a job, like, and somebody clicks on your page and they don't see any activity for the last three years, like they're going to wonder whether or not this person is real or whether or not this person is actively involved in those things. And so you have to do your part to make sure that you continually stay focused and consistent in promoting whatever it is, whether it's part of your personal life, whether it's something that's happening in a broader industry, whatever it is, but there has to be something like nothing is not an option. It is a long game and it's really about establishing a reputation over time. You have yes. to earn people's trust and respect. You know, when it comes to attention, we've learned the hard way that it's only two ways to get it. You can either buy it or you can earn it. And to earn it takes a really long time. And one of the hardest parts about self-promotion is that there are very few metrics to let you know whether you're being successful. One of the biggest risk factors or traits for burnout is when you're doing a bunch of work and you're not making yeah. any progress or you're not able to measure your progress. So the way that you counter that with self-promotion is that you create these small you can make them daily or weekly, but you create a series of small goals so that when you're making measurable progress, you can cross these things off the list. It could be things like reaching out or making a connection or subscribing to a new newsletter, yeah. leaving a comment. You know who does a great job at this? Cynia from Financed. She's a career and wealth coach, yep. great follow, but she's been looking for a job for a while. And every month she posts how many jobs she's applied to. And then she has like a little scoreboard where it's like 13 of them were initially rejected. I have four interviews. And it took me a long time to realize this, but at the end of the day, those big milestones that we're looking for are actually lagging indicators. They come after you've gone through the slog of a hundred applications or after you've published a bunch of posts that went to crickets or after you showed up to awkward events and met and shook hands and exchanged business cards with people. Those are the leading indicators of whether you're going to hit your goal or not. You know who does a terrible job at this? <laughs> My friend, Mike. <laughs> Mike, I love I'm him. sorry if you're listening. I love him. He's not listening. He's not that type of person. Maybe he does. But I'll tell you something about Mike, because God bless him. I haven't spoken to him in a while. Whenever he pops up on social media, that's when I know that something's about to happen. Like, oh, well, he must have an art exhibit coming up. Or, oh, he must have launched a new thing or something like that. Like, it's always right around those times. That's when he wants to all of a sudden be social on right. social media, right? And this is what I mean in terms of like, I get it, like maybe there's a rationale, maybe there's a mental health concern, but like, that's not how you do it. You've got to show up more consistently, not just when you want something from other people. And when you do show up, it can't always be about what you want from them. It has to also be like you celebrating other people who are out there trying Hello. and saying, wow, I did work with you and you are absolutely right. Or take it a step further and say, wow, you know what? I think you're shortchanging yourself. You're more than just this. You're even better. I remember when we worked on this project together and you were great, blah, blah, blah. These are all of the other things that you can do to make yourself a little bit more visible. And we've spoken about this on LinkedIn, but I just don't see enough of it because they just don't see themselves as those kinds of people. They feel like it's icky, they get overwhelmed. And unfortunately, those are also the people who struggle. Yeah, They struggle when they're ready to make a leap or when they're ready to make a change and they can't figure out exactly what they need to do. They let the fear of rejection or you know, not getting any engagement or any validation get in the way of it. And you've got to overcome that and continue down that path. Because to your point, it's very much a long game. And, you know, honestly, the benefit of doing it for a long time consistently is that it starts to show up in other areas of your life. It becomes a habit. And that habit pays in dividends, yes. right? You start to advocate for what you want and negotiate and ask for the things that you think you deserve. It's going to lead to you getting better prices on your cars, yes. on your homes, better yes. jobs, better interactions with your partner, better everything. Like It is compounding in the right way and not doing it compounds in the wrong way. 
But I do want to touch on the fear because you brought this up in last week's episode with Kim. And you talked about how despite us being the most well-resourced, well-educated, most prepared generation, there are so many of us that are walking around scared. Well, we're hiding behind our credentials, right? Yeah. Like we know we've got the degree, we think it speaks for itself, but we're completely disregarding the fact that on graduation day, you weren't the only person in the room standing up. There were 200 other people, depending on how large your class is. Like we could arguably say thousands, depending on how big, and that was just your school. I was about to on say all day, the schools graduated. On that day, on that weekend, hundreds of thousands of people all stood up and threw a hat in the air and had the exact same credential on paper as you did. Right. And that's the reality. So it is super competitive. But even if we're not just talking about the credentials, you spoke about the conversation we had with Kim. I remember the conversation that we had with Janice and we were talking about Bad Bunny and the cultural effect that he had on and the cultural effect that he has on Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rico as a whole. And she used the word rebellion, right? Like rebel, like she's always had this sort of sense of rebellion in her but like i think about that and like how sometimes it requires some other person to just give this extra level of you know what i think i can do it and i can do it in an authentic way and maybe for a lot of people they just don't have that right now but i would advise that you just you find that spark plug someone something that you can say, you know what, I'm going to be a little bit more like X, Y, Z. And that's the kind of energy that I'm going to bring into this exercise, because more often than not, like those are the people that have something that you want. Not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I know I'm name dropping a lot. I'll, I'll skip a name this time. I was talking to someone who um, had seen all the work that we've been doing the last couple of years. They'd been laid off and they were struggling to kind of find their footing a little bit. And they were asking like, well, what do you think? Like, how did you do that? And one of the last questions they asked me was, how did you deal with the adversity? And I didn't really know. I was like, well, what do you mean? Like what, what adversity? He was like, you know, just like, and he was talking about all the stuff, right? Like the having the big idea, but like being afraid to put it out there or being afraid to burn bridges because what if it doesn't work out and you aren't able to kind of go back? And like, I looked at him and I was like, dude, like you've been a VP for like 10, 15 years. Like you've been making bank. Like what, what the fuck are we talking about? Like, <laughs> are you scared? You put your buddies at the country club are going to think of you? Because if that's the case, then you don't really want the thing that you're going after. Do you know what I mean? Like you are much more comfortable with living in that fear, right? Like, you like the way that fear looks on you. And so if that's what you want, then that's fine. But like, you can't want to make a change, want to be this other person. You can't want those things. Very similar to the conversation we had with our son after we got our butts kicked in a little league game. You can't want to be able to hit like that and play like that if you're not willing to do the things that that team did. That wasn't luck. Like they did that because they were trained to do that and they've been doing it for a really, really long time. And this is where we are. Like, and, and unfortunately, so many of us kind of have that game within our careers where they, it's just a hard stop. And you thought you were good. You thought you were fine. And then all of a sudden you realize that it's really, really hard out here. And the bar is now here. Yes. And you, you might not get picked yeah. and it's really, really difficult. So all of that to say, I get the fear, but also ask yourself, like, how afraid are you really? Like, are you afraid that you're not going to be able to eat? Because if that's what we're talking about, then I can understand. If those are the stakes, I can understand. But in most cases we're talking about, oh my God, like, what are my neighbors going to think? Or what are my former coworkers going to think? Who gives a shit? Like, yeah. this is about you. Because I can assure you, the people who are getting those jobs that you want or that are unlocking those deals that you want as an entrepreneur are more often than not, not concerned with what you think about them. They are living much more fearlessly. And so we've got to get over it. To your point about the chapter we spoke about selling, we were very clear in realizing that that was one of the biggest issues that we know people have. Like, you just don't have the courage. You yes. need courage. And when we think about courage... We think about it in life or death situations like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do if there's a fire? And it's like sometimes you need these little micro nuggets of courage to just get over the freaking hump yes. and solve the problem. But in this market, you cannot want to raise and want the big job and not have an online profile or something where people can validate and say, yes, they are deserving of this money 
and they are exactly who I should be looking for, I can end my search now. Like right. in what world do people think that that's how this is going to happen? Yeah. For people who either don't want to feel that fear or are not currently feeling that fear and are in this boat, it's because they're not challenging themselves to actually do something where there's some risk involved. Yes. Because there is risk involved in putting yourself out there. But as the goals of work are changing and the nature of employment is changing, you have to manage your fears. Managing your fears is going to be a necessary path if you want to control the narrative of your career and actually be a sought after employee, right? Like this is going to be the cost of entry before it used to be, you know, getting a degree and being willing to go to school for four years. And now it's being willing to swallow that big lump in your throat yeah. and post something online. One of the only ways to push through that fear is to get excited about what's on the other side of it. And there are plenty of people who will give you examples and stories about what's on the other side. You can listen to any podcast. We ask every guest on our podcast, like, what was the moment and yeah. what happened after that? You can see what is on the other side of your fear. And that excitement for that is going to be one of the only things that pushes you through to be consistent and create on a regular basis yeah. and push yourself to make a commitment to put yourself out there more. So yeah. I get it. It's hard, but... <laughs> You know, you know, what's not hard leaving us a five star rating and review. <laughs> I love it. Nice segue. <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, that is it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Rich and Regular podcast. If you like what you heard, leave us a note below or tell us in your five star rating and review. We will see y'all next week week. Peace. If you like videos like this and want to see more, make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications. 